welcome to Ideas of India, where we examine academic ideas that can propel India forward. My name is Shruti Rajagopalan and I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Today, my guest is Sajid Pai, who is a partner at Bloom Ventures. Sajid is a long-time media executive turned VC. At Bloom, Sajid supports investments in media, edtech and e-commerce, while also helping Bloom build a research and knowledge platform. Sajid has an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and a BA in economics from Chaugule College in Goa. He's also a writer and you can find his writings on startups, e-commerce, venture capital, culture, political economy, education and more on his website sajidpai.com. We spoke about the 2023 Indus Valley Annual Report written by Sajid and his co-author Amal Vats at Bloom Ventures. The many countries that make up the country of India artificial intelligence the venture capital community manufacturing growth and much more for a full transcript of this conversation including helpful links of all the references mentioned click the link in the show notes or visit discoursemagazine.com Hi Sajid, welcome to the show. It is such a pleasure to have you here. I've followed you and your work for a long time and I'm very excited to have this chat. Hey, thanks Shruti. Thanks for having me over. Likewise, big fan of your writing and the podcast. It's probably my favorite podcast. Ah, I'm so thrilled to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell Amit Verma that. Yeah. Uh, no, I won't. Yeah. I'm not giving Amit Verma any free publicity if I can help it. <laughs> I think he has more than enough. <laughs> I want to kick off our conversation with the latest Indus Valley annual report. This of course is co-written by you and Amal Vats who's you know both your co-author and also your colleague at Bloom. And this is also a continuation of the same effort that you have made last year. And the lovely thing is you you've sort of made it almost a pedagogical exercise. It goes viral in the Indus Valley which is the Indian startup you know pun on silicon valley and there's just so much to learn i feel in terms of the broader narrative of what's happening in india from this report not just the startup scene i want to start with this lovely classification that you and amal have developed which is india 1 india 2 india 3 where india 1 is you know the very elite about 120 million in size and per capita of mexico roughly and perhaps more elite in education then then what is signaled by mexico as a country most of the startups operate here this is the base of the most sophisticated consumers you know sort of the most mature users who spend a big chunk of their consumption expenditure you know in this space then you talk about india 2 which is about another 100 million people and then the rest of the country is india 3 which is really sub saharan africa level when it comes to gdp per capita and consumption expenditure and you know so on my sense from this when i see the overall startup market is that perhaps it's a little too hot and what i mean by that is you know especially e-commerce and fintech they are growing much faster than india 1 and india 2 are growing in terms of gdp per capita is that a fair way to think about it in the sense that it is the gdp per capita of 2200 which is the absolute concrete ceiling for the growth of many of these you know startups or am i missing something else there is some unexploited consumer base which is not that tightly linked with income and all the money flowing into these startups is not really just you know hot money ballooning into something else but actually genuine growth Uh, thank you for capturing that so well. You're absolutely right in a way that there is a. I want to choose my words very carefully because I'm both an inhabitant of that world yet I aspire to be an observer and critic. I do feel there is a disconnect, if we can say, between the funding that India receives and the fact that the economic engine and pretty much sometimes the sole market for many products is really India one. I dare say there is perhaps a smaller market tucked away within India one, which we refer to as India one alpha, which is the world of iPhone and Starbucks and Netflix and all of these DTC direct to consumer brands that pop up. That is like a Taiwan, you could say, twenty five million people, eight million households, thirty five thousand dollar per capita income. So that's kind of tucked away within India one. I think a way, fair way to kind of look at this disconnect is to say that. The Indian startup ecosystem solves a certain problem for the West, which is it solves the capital allocation problem for a tiny set of managers. 
sitting in the US and Europe worried about the fact that they have to pay those pension bills which are due and looking at all of their investments. These are folks sitting in the large endowments like the university endowments, sometimes in organizations such as CalPERS or the Ontario Teachers Pension. And so what they do is they look at this large Excel sheet and say, oh, you know, we're not getting terrific returns on the market. We need to get even better returns. Let's look at alternative assets. And within the alternative assets, venture has been the hero category. And really within that, they're looking at India as a market. And really what I think India does in some ways, we are solving a certain capital allocation problem, to put it bluntly, for a certain set of managers. I do feel that when you look at actually the Indian venture market, which this last year, 2022 calendar year was about $24 billion. $24 billion consisted of broadly, there is a very early stage, which is where the fund that I work out of Bloom operates, barely 10% of that 24, not even 10% of that 24. The bulk of that is growth money, which comes from large hedge funds, crossover funds, and they investing in startups because of a very unique problem uh, or unique situation that has arisen. Historically, venture funds used to invest in startups and those startups to go to IPO in three, four, five years. Amazon, four years. Google, five years or six years. But as tech started giving great returns, more and more money started going into tech. The elongation of kind of uh, the journey from the first funds received till IPO, it really got elongated. And what happened is a lot of these larger funds saw the pre-IPO funding or growth stage funding as a viable proposition because they said, let's suck out more value out of this instead of leaving it for retail investors to grab. And I think a lot of that is happening in India too. For example, Boat, which is one of the most successful direct-to-consumer brands in the consumer consumer brands electronic space, got money from Warburg Pinkers saying, do not go IPO, here's the money, take it and build more. Similarly, Lenskart was able to kind of stretch out its IPO. So I'm probably bringing in too many items and probably kind of uh, stacking argument a bit much, but fundamentally, you're right, it is hot. There is a disconnect between the actual market as well as what is coming into the venture market. A lot of that is coming from US larger investors seeking to solve a particular problem. And that might be creating certain problems of indigestion, if I may put it like that. If I may add, I think, you know, you've explained the financial side very well, which is, you know, the demand for this kind of growth, which is being fueled by US endowments, you know, private equity funds, and of course, the big VC, you know, network and world. But the other part of it, I feel is also perhaps a misunderstanding of, you know, India one, which is Taiwan versus India one, which is Mexico versus India two, in the sense that there are very few goods and services, like say big e-commerce platforms like Flipkart, Amazon, or maybe EdTech, which is an aspirational product, right? For India two and India three, they're willing to spend on EdTech to hope that their children and the next generation will make it to India one. Other than some things like in these sectors, it seems like fundamentally the India 1 subset and India 1 and India 2 are fundamentally different markets, right? Because it's not easy to monetize, right? India 2, India 3. You can see on YouTube, there are lots of people willing to give their eyeballs on YouTube, right? It's a relatively poor country, low opportunity cost of giving their eyeballs for lots of content. Geo has made content very cheap, but none of them can ever enter the subscriber model willingly other than, you know, maybe gamification or, you know, some small pockets and niches here and there. But it's very difficult for Netflix to capture the 800 million market, you know, which is on very, very high quality broadband in the same way that it is for YouTube to capture that market. So is some of this growth also being fueled by this fundamental misunderstanding of what is the fundamental difference between these two sectors? So one I can think of is just the ability to pay both in terms of cash flow and income. The other is the user experience right? You've written about this on your blog separately on how India has, you know, sort of native level English speakers. They're a tiny, tiny group. They're basically Taiwan, right? And then the English, comfortable English fluent, that's a slightly larger group. So if we really want to capture 800 million people who are online to come onto these services, the user interface also has to fundamentally be different. You know, it shouldn't be in English. The transaction shouldn't be entirely reliant on English fluency. So 
Is that the supply side misunderstanding when people are trying to fuel this growth? Yeah, no, it was a great question. So I mean, let's unpack that. You are absolutely right in the sense that there are two broad markets, India 1 and India 2. And both behave very differently, both transact slightly differently, and both interact with products, uh, software products, as well as some hardware products differently. Whether it's India 1A, but India 1 broadly is very familiar with, you know, and it's pretty similar to how, for example, their peers or counterparts would be in the US. They are happy to look at dense information-packed flat screen monitors or glass rectangles in their hands click on colored rectangles using their mouse and pay with their credit cards, right? India too, many of them don't have credit cards because, hey, we have only 35 million credit card holders, right? All of whom live in India 1. India 2 struggles to get credit. They are mystified by the checkout experience. Many of them have actually found out that the checkout page and including the page which takes them to the OTP, which is a very unique Indian thing that every transaction has to be consummated by feeding in a one-time password which comes to your mobile phone is only in English. That's strange, right? And so that page itself mystifies a lot of people apparently. And even the format of shopping, looking at 10, 12 products, choosing between them, uh, there is a tyranny of choice for them too. They're used to going and asking for, Kya umto dal de do? like, you know, and someone, the shopkeeper gives them dal, like, you know. So I would say in all of these things, there is a disconnect with what is sort of the native UI, the native transaction model and the native business model, which is well suited for India 1. When you go to India too, a lot of these things fail. And what you need to do then, and some of the successful Indian startups have evolved a digital vocabulary that is well suited to the needs of India too. Okay. Sometimes it can be as like Dream 11's Harsh Jain said that if you are charging 300 rupees in India 1, do not charge 300 rupees. Instead, charge 10 rupees every day. And you will have customers. So sort of satiatization of that. Second, for example, COD. COD was invented by Flipkart because they saw that they were struggling to kind of penetrate that. COD is cash for delivery where you actually pay when the goods come to you. This one it solves for a lot of challenges. BNPL, so now RBI has time needed, which is buy now, pay later, emerged as a way to kind of overcome the lack of enough credit cards. Then, for example, voice UIs have emerged. Google says 28% of their search is voice related in India. It's very high. So many of these and models such as Misho, DealShare have all emerged, which are very native to India too, Okay, which are built around resellers, which are built around maybe group interaction and buying. Okay, Even though they've not reached China level numbers, many of these attempts or share chat, for example, trying to kind of popularize a native UI, they're all impressive efforts. I don't think anyone has really hit breakaway scale in India too, other than, hey, YouTube, WhatsApp, Facebook. And they're all free. And they're all free. With ad revenue. With ad revenue. That's it. To be very honest, Shruti, India too, ad revenue. I don't think India too is easy to sell to advertisers. Bulk of the ad revenue that India sees, seven billion dollars, etc. But eighty percent comes to Google and Meta, Facebook, Meta, which includes Instagram and YouTube as well. But twenty twenty five percent comes from the others, of which about a billion apparently now comes from retail media, which is Amazon, Flipkart as well. All of this is strictly speaking India one, India two. There isn't enough monetization yet, but what seems to be happening is there are people willing to pay small sums of money. And if you can get into that model, don't charge them what Harsh Jain said. Don't charge 400 rupees at one time. Instead, charge micro sashes. And for Netflix, for example, they've actually reduced their price to as much as 149 rupees in India. And they're, they're just throwing the kitchen sink at the market. Perhaps it'll get them some traction. But I think the better way for them would have been to do sashes, the way mobile phone data is sold or historically used to be sold. So there are a few, so share chat is one, stage, which does Haryan Me, which does Haryan Me content and they call themselves the Netflix or Bharat. Cuckoo FM, Pocket FM, they've all come up with very tiny, inexpensive monthly models or weekly models by which people can pay. And we're beginning to see early signs of consumer paid, but we'll have to see how big this gets. But you're absolutely right. India too is a country of, I would say, viewers, not really consumers. And I don't think they've gotten to become consumers taking out 
the credit card or wallet or what have you, UPI. But it is very early signs are there and some of those companies are beginning to kind of double down and, you know, keep improving their models. But there is, yes, India too is still not a kind of a paying market. Yes. And it's really interesting because, you know, the sashitization is something that Unilever and PNG and, you know, we had surf laundry detergent, which usually, you know, at least if you live in the United States, comes in these horrible, you know, two, three gallon sizes. And in India, it used to be a tiny sachet because there was a storage problem. There was a cash flow problem. And of course, there was an income cap problem. You can't spend your weekly or monthly income on a giant tub of you know, laundry detergent. And they had that for everything from hair dye, you know, to shampoo, to soap. In fact, during COVID, we saw hand sanitizers being sold in tiny sachets. So this is something that is very, very well known in the, you know, FMCG consumer goods market. Even cigarettes, if you go to a pan shop, are sold in singles. They'll open a box of cigarettes and they will sell you one at a time. You know, it's it's funny. As economists, we have absorbed this. But I guess, you know, some of the startup community is still figuring this out. So on that, my question is, is that learning a little bit delayed because of the nature of the startup founders that, you know, at least until two, three years ago, most of them were from urban areas. They belong to India 1A, you know, coming from elite families, speaking English, sort of making DoorDash for India and, you know, then converting that into then a slightly more Indianized experience, right? So is it what, you know, Alex Tabarrok and I call the typical elite imitation of, you know, you, you sort of inhabit the Netflix world. So that's the world, you know, they live in. Or is it because the way the venture capital funnel and situation works, it is not accustomed to these kinds of small and micro payments. They like to see big numbers, big growth. They want to capture a particular type of consumer. And they're not that thrilled about capturing, you know, these consumers. So so where do you think this is coming from? Partly what you've said is true. In the sense that these are India 1A typically, right? To start up, you have to be privileged to start up, right? No one who is really, I think, trying to take care of their family is going to come into startups. They want to join an Infosys or a TCS or, or even a McKinsey, for example, right? You want a stable job. So all startup founders are super privileged, right. even though they will all say they're middle class. Perhaps that typical Indian tendency to kind of say your middle class is all there, but they're all privileged. So Shruti, certainly the fact that they are not used to some of these transaction models is a factor. I think an important factor is also that most Indian founders start by looking at the West, at Silicon Valley. You learn from, for example, YC Startup School. You listen to the podcasts, for example, whether it's Twinkie VC or the Colossus Invest Like the Best podcast. You hear of those models, Right. Then you maybe go to Y Combinator or you read the first round review. They read Paul Graham. They read Paul Graham, right? So when you read the canon and when you read all of that, and then none of this is explained there, right? Paul Graham doesn't write about sacerdotization, right? 20 VCs, Uber interviews don't talk about cash. They say credit card and just there's no OTP there. Uber had to introduce cash in India. And I think there is a tendency for the startup world to kind of think of everything from themselves, right? Derive everything first principles. I would say that because I have come 18 years experience in, in an Indian, traditional Indian company, where a lot of FMCG professionals came into, and because a lot of my batchmates from B-School went to FMCG companies, and I've read a lot of work in, in that, I know for a fact that principles like job to be done, positioning, segmentation, there are enough models which exist. Here, call it minimum viable product. There, you have the test market, for example, and you have frameworks, for example. For various reasons, I think Indian startup founders like to look into West, try and apply that directly. And then when that doesn't work, they kind of, then they look at China. But China is also very different, right? Not all of China is like India. China is in many ways an affluent country. Shanghai and Beijing and all are $20,000 plus per capita income. So then finally they have to sit and derive. But that's it. Startup founders learn fast. The moment they see something working in India, they double down on it. And the speed of learning is incredible. And I would say there is a kind of learn, I would say, community of founders who come in together to teach what happens in India. For example, there's SaaS Boomi. Then there is a direct-to-consumer, D2C insider community. 
So communities that are coming together to say that, hey, you can't apply what happened in the West. This is what you need to do. Enough writing is beginning to happen and enough podcasts are happening. So a certain body of knowledge is getting developed as to how do you crack India too. And But I think the primary reason for that, or one of the two reasons for that is we look to the West and then try and apply that here. And B, it's a very alien world for us. Yeah, so both of those factors. You know, so the cash on delivery statistic is fantastic. I think this was last year's uh, Indus Valley report where you had this figure in there. It said that 50% of e-commerce transactions, you know, which are mainly mainly tier one transactions. So these are the sophisticated users. They're the consumers. 50% are actually cash on delivery. And I found that staggering for a couple of reasons. Is this happening because there are only 35 million credit card holders? Or is it happening because they are a little bit nervous about credit cards getting hacked? You know, there's still new electronics users. This is sort of my parents' generation, right? They're a little bit nervous about just giving their information away. They're worried about hacks and so on. Or is it more fundamentally about trust in Indian market in the sense that we know contracts are not enforced, right? So they're willing to do UPI when they're already in the auto rickshaw and it's not asynchronous. It's it's exactly at the time of buying that you're paying. Or, you know, when they go to the, uh, you know, vegetable market or the grocery store, they're happy to do that. But when they buy now and pay later, when there is a gap which necessarily requires some kind of contract enforcement, in case it doesn't happen, they want cash on delivery. So it's sort of they are bypassing the problem of weak state capacity and so on. So what is the propelling reason for such high number of transactions which are cash on delivery? Yeah, trust is certainly one factor. Second would be, for example, convenience as a factor, which is, for example, if you are buying apparel, and apparel is a very sizable proportion of Indian e-commerce, close to 30%. Sizing is a big issue. And India is a country famous for lack of standardization. Because historically, e-commerce used to be mobile e-commerce, right? In the sense that not that things were purchased on mobile, they were. But more than 50% of e-commerce was mobile phones at one time, right? Because that was how narrow the shallow the market was. Now, of course, e-commerce has mobile, it's only about 30% or so of the market. And apparel is now very close to mobile phones in terms of 27, 28%. Other electronics around 10, 15%. So because apparel is still a very sizable portion, almost 70 to 80% of apparel is purchased on cash on delivery, even in slightly affluent households because of the sizing issue. They buy two items, etc. Third is checkout friction. Sometimes you feel that you've historically not got things on time or things take time. Sometimes, you know, you pay and that item is not there to get the money back is awkward. So I would say these are three factors, uh, lack of trust, convenience of the checkout and sizing or those convenience factors. I think they all kind of come in. We did check with a very senior person in one of the, you know, logistics companies which serves e-commerce. And he said that, no, it has not changed the last three years. The minor blips during COVID when kind of people started paying and demonetization was another one. But otherwise, other than these two times, uh, it's historically been the same number. It's not changed too much. This is what I really love about the report that you put together because it tells us something, you know, sort of like the deeper cracks and fault lines in India, right? So what we learned from this is, at least what I took away from this is the digital public goods infrastructure that we have, which is, you know, your India stack, which is Aadhaar, UPI, you know, the credit system and so on. We've just leapfrogged into the next century, right? We had nothing and then we just leapfrogged. The physical infrastructure is lagging, but it is slowly catching up. We do have, you know, electrification. We do have clean water, pipe clean water, which is almost, you know, nearing 100%. We have now, you know, metros in tier two, tier three cities. All of this is picking up. But there is a lag compared to the digital infrastructure. And then finally, when it comes to human capital, right, which is investment in education and health, that is lagging behind both of these, right, which is why there is an issue with You know, something as simple as staffing, you know, district magistrate courts, we can't fill in all the vacancies, which obviously has implications for contract enforcement, right? People, even though they have gone to an English medium school, are not able to transact in English beyond a fifth grade level, you know, so they have trouble with the UX or UI, you know, interface. So it feels like this is another layer which is underneath everything you're telling me about you know, the startup and the venture world, which is booming, which is 
this stuff has not really kept pace. Is that a fair assessment of, you know, how we've invested in the country? Fair. So can't argue with that. And I would say that if I look at, for example, stats and I've been part of the education industry, so to say, before, the number of people, there's this talk about, hey, India graduates, 1.5 million engineers, right? And we all take pride in that, the second largest after China or whatever. But when you actually dig deeper, actually, it's not 1.5. I came to the fact that only 700,000 or so graduate, right? And within that, I found out that the quality engineers, the kind of engineers, for example, who could probably do the kind of work of, say, write clean code or write at least well-functioning code, who are on par with a U.S. engineer, would be around 70,000, would be about 10% of that, right? When you add up all the IITs and IITs, or even tier one colleges. So 70,000 to about 80,000 is that number. So when you actually dig deeper and when you kind of just push the numbers, even though they sound sizable, quality numbers are like a tenth of everything, right? Even if you do that with hospitals, if you say that of hospitals which have, you know, well-trained AHPs or which have these, these facilities, again, you will come down. So some of it is definitely, I think, lack of in kind of, I would say, investment, certainly lack of uh, public investment. And I think a lot of it is um, kind of not an expert here, is also to do with the way state has allocated resources and into, uh, I would say, tertiary prestige education or symbols. I think Land Pritchett said it very well when he contrasted, I forget the podcast, but he contrasted India with Indonesia. And he looked at how India's education investments by the state has gone into tertiary elite symbols. Whereas Indonesia has gone into a little more fundamental one. Not surprising, Indonesia has 2x India's per capita income. Okay. And yeah, but India exports engineers to uh, Indonesia and Bangkok to Indonesia. So again, I'm not an expert at this thing. I think there are also, I think, challenges and probably it's something that I want to answer in the next edition. I find it very surprising that Indian cities, large Indian cities, can't kind of raise money. There is no municipal bond market like in the US or in China. Or I'm not an expert. Your podcast with Alain Barto was very illuminating on this account. And I do think because a lot of investment is centrally driven, right? And kind of so on. We also don't have enough investment going into where it's really needed, I feel like, you know, which is which is probably primary education, primary healthcare, etc. But really, I'm not the expert here on those. So I need to be cautious about kind of overstretching my revenue. No, I think you're an expert on those on a different margin, because when you look at how Uber is driving, no pun intended, you know, the transportation gaps that it's filling in urban sectors, you're able to see a different part of the puzzle on the missing public infrastructure and urban sprawl than say someone like Allah or I are able to see because we're looking at a different picture through municipal bonds or, you know, fiscal federalism or something like that. You know, here, this is also a weirder thing where the startup market is so consumer focused, right? Whereas the government is so things focused. We want to build things. We don't necessarily want to invest in people and then let people go where they want. And of course, that you know, is about both urbanization, but it's also about do they want to be a linguist or do they want to be an engineer or do they want to be a doctor, right? So we are only going to establish the absolute pioneering institutes of linguistics or engineering. We're not actually going to invest in people and get them up to a point of, oh, they can make any choice that they want. Is this lack of investment in human capital, both, you know, health expenditure, education expenditure at the grassroots primary level, is that going to, again, create a very natural ceiling for the startup world when it comes to going from, you know, the one way of saying it is that, you know, the startup people go from catering to India, you know, 1A to India 1 to India 2. But another way of thinking about it is the people who were traditionally in India 2 kind of move up into India 1, right? So both of these things, does the lack of investment in human capital, do you see that as a natural barrier or will India bypass it in some other way? Because India's growth story is this bizarre outlier story, right? It just kind of bypasses all these traditional problems. So how do you see that playing out? So India is a country of leapfrogging. Like, you know, our story is a story of leapfrogging and Indian ingenuity will find a way. But to your question, I have to say that if the Indian startup ecosystem is a much sizable proportion of India than it would be in an equivalent country, like it's even a China, for example. 
if you look at it, for example, all the money that has gone in is what 140, 150 billion dollars over the last 12, 13 years. And roughly, I would say all of the value that is created, I mean, it's all notional to a certain extent. Some of it is listed is around $650 billion. And that is about a fifth of the Indian market capitalization. Okay. So it's sizable. If you take just unicorns, unicorns are about 10% of India's market cap, which is two double of all other countries. Okay. And if you look at jobs, for example, startups account for 8% of the organized formal market sick jobs in India. So startups punch well about their weight and increasingly what's happened is, and one of my favorite expressions is supply creates its own demand in India. And what you're seeing is all of the money that has kind of come into Indian startup ecosystem is beginning to seek return. And when it seeks return, it expands its limit. If in the US, for example, they said that, hey, we're going to solve SaaS, we're going to solve some consumer things. And now the big money is going to go into space and into biotech, deep tech. In India, a lot of startup founders and venture money is actually beginning to go into sectors typically you wouldn't see necessarily in the US. Okay. For example, we've invested in a startup which is training AHPs, allied healthcare professionals, because there's a gap in India. And we're beginning to kind of look at sectors where there's an absolute choke point. For example, there are only X number of new veterinarians coming out or X number of audiologists coming out. And they're very critical, right? And startups are beginning to look at trying to kind of work with existing partners and amplify their reach or their ability to serve. And that is one. B, startups are beginning to drive, for example, if you take Zetwork or Nexpert or Groyo, these are all Indian startups in the, in the manufacturing space. And what they've done is pioneered a new way of manufacturing, what I call parallel manufacturing, where they work with existing MSMEs, most of whom are not super efficient. But really what they do is they kind of get an order from the West and spread it across the diversify risk. And try and use technology, diversify risk, so create cloud factories. And sort of, I think it is very hard to kind of set up a factory from scratch like China with, you know, 10,000, 30,000 workers. It's not easy. Just to buy land is not easy. But to sort of create this cloud factory is something that Indian startups have kind of pioneered. And so I would say both these examples kind of tell you how, for example, startups are essentially saying, look, we need to solve some of these real problems. Fortunately, I think there is enough patient capital there kind of coming in. And all of these experiments, I don't know how many of them will work out, but we are beginning to see more braver experiments, more you kind know, of grassroots experiments. Agritech has a bunch of them, health has a bunch of them, and so on. I completely agree with you. And I think some of this is driven by founders who are not coming from very large cities and very elite, you know, education centers or have gone to university in the United States or, you know, the India A category. They're just much more in tune with the real world problems that people want to solve and are willing to pay money for. On the question of, you know, veterinary advice or allied health workers advice, do you think India will again leapfrog into AI directly? Because we can see that, you know, GPT-4 is able to pass the bar exam in the US. It is able to give pretty competent medical sort of advice on kind of basic questions, you know, I mean, it can't cure cancer, but it can help you through a sinus infection. And India anyway, doesn't have very strong, I mean, it has strong regulation on prescriptions and things like that. It's just never enforced and never followed. So do you see India leapfrogging in that direction? And therefore, a lot of people are interested in getting India 2 and India 3 just as viewers, because they can collect data, they can fine tune the algorithm, it will help large language models become better, they'll get better at, you know, people speaking into large language models and have a sort of personal assistant or a personal medical advisor, you know, a personal veterinarian, as opposed to, you know, traditionally, the way other countries have done it, which is build up a human workforce to solve these problems. I see that as sort of like the next frontier of how India leapfrogs this problem. I don't know what that will do to India's labor force potential, but you know, I mean, everyone can't be a dunzo delivery person, right? So there's got to be something. But do you see AI solving that? Very interesting. I really don't know. Is it true? And at this point, I'm looking at all the debate that's happening around GPT-4, beginning to see that code writing and certain white-collar tasks, uh, defined white-collar tasks, 
like for example there's a friend for example who's using it to write marketing copy it can be sped up like in minutes he's able to get what would take for example a freelance writer like a half a day to write so there are aspects which are actually you know where for example you can actually see that you don't need may not need as many engineers but you may need engineers to test that out for example or until gpt4 kind of buttons that so it can kind of mimic testing okay or gpt5 that will be i do see that wherever there is a need for a human element to be bundled in and if gpt4 for example you're fundamentally giving someone the caregiver and ability to kind of not be fully regulated like you don't have to pass bar exam equivalent like licensed exam equivalent but you have for example a certain set of kind of maybe an ipad with an, an ability to kind of find out answers so certainly you could see variants of that coming so you may have for example the market spreading into hey i want a harvard or like you know a yale trained medic who will kind of give me complete human care b might be that hey i'm okay with kind of a human plus medical whatever and we need to pay x dollars for that and third could be that hey i have to query a bot and at my own risk so would models like this come potentially will be experiments okay and the way they could come from there could be vet if there's an absolute shortage of vets for example and you have for example someone like that who's able to query and provide the care component and with the expert component coming through for example like a gpt4 gpt5 backend that could be a possibility so certain jobs would get created certain jobs i would say a lot of the translation freelance writing all of those jobs may disappear so early days i would love to see how this evolves but i would say that new opportunity that could open up like i think you alluded to i so i must speak is really this people plus expertise and sort of a expert light if that could come so that could certainly be but yeah but really i don't know shruti i mean it, it's really interesting then yeah No I really appreciate your answer my instinct is also that it will be human plus expertise you know we have such a shortage of vets which means gpt4 and 5 will do the entire chatbot questionnaire and then the vet only needs to actually physically see you for 10 minutes as opposed to an hour right so instead of creating a new army of veterinarians we use the existing veterinarians in a much more efficient way and you know supplement them with a bot as opposed to a medical assistant so i also very much see it going that way i'm not hugely worried about oh it's going to kill all the jobs i mean india already has such a tiny fraction in the formal workforce and that group can get retrained it's a fairly elite group so i'm not panicked about that as much as the leap frogging part you know which is you know india just bypassed household broadband right which you talk about in your report i wrote a substack on how india just bypassed household phones because for the longest time there was this huge shortage of you know phone connections because it was completely state owned state controlled quotaed and then we went straight to smartphones right so the actual number of landlines never quite took off in india compared to its uh, gdp per capita so you know this leapfrogging thing is something we've seen happen over and over again which is quite interesting you were talking about manufacturing growth a moment ago and there are a couple of interesting things so in the report the phrase that you use that i found lovely was manufacturing growth by stealth right which is not the typical you know a big factory is going to be built and sort of deployed in a particular area it's going to employ lots of local workers you know thousands in textile manufacturing or shoe manufacturing or something like that and then we go from there and that's very much the south korean taiwanese malaysian chinese and now bangladesh story right everything from shoe laces to iphones got built that way and in india for various i mean mainly regulatory reasons in india regulation has always punished manufacturing scale right mainly through factor markets both your you know labor law the way the land markets function so scale is very difficult to achieve in india without having government blessing and government intervention so now we see scale in infrastructure and things like that which you know clearly is pushed by the government but not so much in manufacturing so what are the natural limits of manufacturing growth by stealth i mean to a very large extent this manufacturing by cloud can reduce transactions costs of manufacturing across 100 different small factories so can india actually become a manufacturing giant despite bypassing the scale problem or once again we're going to hit a natural limit after we exploit the capacity in these i'm going to say that it is going to be hard to 
cloud factorize your way, if that's a legitimate term, you're right. There are going to be finite limits to which you can do this because after a certain point in time, it's, it's this entire course, Ronald Courses, I forget the term now, that wonderful essay which he wrote about coordinating costs. Right? So tech can take care of certain coordination costs and can push out the boundaries right? or bring in the boundary to say, I'll keep them out and I have technology to kind of coordinate. But I think there will be finite limits hitting soon because you will find that for complex orders, high value orders, it's going to be hard to rely on. Then you want to say that, hey, I'm going to bring in certain people in house and I'm going to work with them for really high value orders and all of that stuff will happen. I feel that unless to get really hit scale, right, to really hit some of the numbers that Vietnam is hitting, and I actually looked at other numbers, we didn't put it out there because it was the kind of data that honestly, like, again, I only had one slide, but that slide fundamentally said and came from an AT Carney or a Carney report, which said that bulk of the production which had left China had actually gone to Vietnam, okay? And a lot of this also Chinese major setting up in Vietnam, but fundamentally it's gone to Vietnam, not so much to India, right, you know. And I think, again, if you look at some of the recent numbers, there's been like manufacturing, for example, exports hasn't grown the way it should have. So I would say that there has to be, uh, I would say, a strong state-supported policy. And we begin to see some of that in the PLI policy. But then again, you know, it's a long process. People have to kind of see it over many years. Without, I think, a strong state-supported muscular policy, incentives, you know, even state-supported, doesn't have to be federal, but even state-supported, it's going to take off. I think startup engineering will get you till a certain point. And what it will do is it will create the short-term problem. It will solve scale up to a certain level. But the moment you go beyond 200, 300, 400, 500 million dollars, it will be challenging for you to work with really small factories over a point. Yeah, so I think that's the story of startups. They'll solve it till a certain point, but and after that, they'll have to go full stack, which is sort of another learning that I've had that many Indian startups start, unlike in the US, where you can actually, because the volumes are so large, you can be an intermediary and those thin margins are enough because they keep adding up over a lot of transactions. In India, the markets, those thin margins can't take you that far because the volumes are not large. So in India, there's a tendency for startups to become full stack, where they become private label purveyors. They actually do everything from sourcing to delivery themselves, as opposed to the US model whereby you want to kind of outsource everything. So I think this will happen in manufacturing too. And that's super interesting because, you know, India is basically a services driven economy, right? Like about 50% plus comes from services, not from manufacturing. And though 50% of the population works in the rural agrarian sector, they're only about 15% of the GDP. And that's really also the difference between, you know, India 1, India 2, India 3. The other weird thing here is a very large proportion of Indian GDP is consumption driven and not yes. investment driven. Yes. Right? So there are two trends here. One is investment is relatively low compared to other developing countries. And the second part is it's declining, right? So, you know, as economists, one of the things we really pay attention to is gross fixed capital formation, especially gross fixed private capital formation. And it has been in secular decline since 2011, you know, well before people started worrying about the slowdown. That time people were still saying it's the after effect of the global financial crisis and so on. But India's never quite recovered there. Is that another reason you see the end-to-end -end of, you know, all transactions being done by the same startup like Nika or someone else, which is you don't parcel out different aspects to different people. So one part is the spreads are really small, the volumes are not large enough. But the other part is the investment is just lacking in all the other sectors that one needs to rely on, right? So the best way to reduce risk and also, you know, become slightly more profitable on the margin, but, you know, reduced uncertainty and risk in your delivery times is to control the entire process end to end. So this is very much Ronald Coase nature of the firm that you were talking about. But in addition to transaction costs, there's a risk and uncertainty aspect which is built into that. Is this also related to investment or lack thereof? Partly, I think the real incentive comes from trying to give a positive service experience. To that extent, yes, you may be right that there is some uncertainty as someone you want to kind of control that end to end. So barring logistics, which you have reasonably good kind of providers, the deliveries of the world, the e-commerce business of the world, everything else you try and kind of control. Sourcing initially is brands 
and brands typically you pay higher prices the margins are low then you start trying to manufacture or own the product yourself so it is driven by experience then margins and third would be i would say what you said uncertainty then you try and kind of bring in more and more things in house so this is sort of the hierarchy it goes so uncertainty would be the third with specific regards to gross capital formation i don't know if that plays this kind of a direct role but i did find that and i didn't do enough work to conclusively come up with a kind of set of findings or insights and relay that into slides one of the interesting points was you write 60% of uh, india's gdp is private like china which is 38% and our gross fixed capital formation is around 30% 29% china's is typically one and a half times that even our government spends as a proportion of gdp is much lower it's only about 10% or so so the finding i couldn't do enough work is that and again the gross fixed capital formation almost two thirds to three fourths is private okay a government is much smaller and private the finding was that the ability to drive more and more investments into private is limited by the fact that they are beginning to get crowded out of credit markets and if at all the next version i would probably want to kind of look at that a little bit that india is an undersized credit market and a lot of ill so to say can be found in that credit as a proportion of gdp is like 55% globally it's 148% right and you can go into more numbers so the fact that the government also competes in the credit markets and leads to a the rates going up higher b certain investments not happening where they should even though private is the larger contributor to fixed capital formation and freeing up the credit market having a bit more i would say not competition but bit more supply into it okay would probably kind of ease gross fixed capital creation a lot more yeah you know on the credit aspect how much do you think india stack can really help and here i'm really talking about you know one part is of course the identity aspect of the india stack you know this is aadhar and you know kyc and you know e signature digi locker you know those sorts of things then you have you know all your upi related you know everything linked to individual bank accounts which is also linked to individual identity which can now be used for peer to peer pay but the third part of that which is relatively underused is the credit enabling infrastructure right so do you see much growth in credit that is being driven by that sector you know both because now the startup economy has added you know almost a third of the new formal workers coming into the salaried class but these are also people who are for the first time you know they may not be from families that are historically rich or you know have strong access to credit but they are for the first time using this india stack right so is that driving some of the uptick in credit as of now no shit as of now the truth is not yet so there is a, a very ambitious initiative of which the first stirrings are there it's called oken open credit enablement network it is essentially flow based lending okay so essentially what it means is let us say you are a business which sells on zomato you could be a baker you could be a pav bhaji vendor etc not very large sole proprietorship or maybe three or four people doing that and various reasons because you've just begun in the last 6 months or 12 months or or maybe you don't have an asset you shut out of banking circles right because they do asset based lending but what oken can do thanks to related initiatives such as an account aggregation framework and all that is enable what's called flow based lending where someone can look at your flows through a tokenized fashion so it's encrypted so you see it, like you don't know who it is you can look at that and say hey this 16 months of continuously increasing revenue i think this chap is good for so much maybe not the last month but maybe the sixth month or seventh month and then you can probably look at how the person repays and then probably increase it so we will see some of those beginning in, and there is effort underway but for we had a chart in the indus valley annual report which told you about how for example that graph is growing about 4 million accounts kind of come under this account aggregation framework etc 
So will that solve the problems? Well, I mean, they will solve some problems, right? It's, it's sort of like cloud factory, right? It will solve to a certain extent. At the margin, it will expand it. So startups are great at expanding boundaries a little bit or bringing in boundaries, sort of, so to say, right? So they can expand boundaries at the margins. They are terrific. But for sustained change and for permanent change, I think you will need a lot more intervention by the state, by the government in kind of expanding that market. So I would say that while I do think we'll have growth, I don't think on its own, India stack will be able to kind of shift everything. Even with India stack, uh, Shruti, I think some of the numbers very surprised that as much as half of India UPI payments, for example, are done by about 7% of the people, 6.5% of people are conflict, 45%. So there is like a, a small group of people who, who are really driving all of this consumption. But is it completely democratized? Well, I, I don't know. It's only 260 million people who use it. It's about a sixth of the country or a, yeah, 20% or so. So I'm not 100% confident that by itself it can solve very problems. The areas where I am particularly optimistic or excited about the open credit enablement network is in education. You know, this is hard to recover. There is no collateral except the individual's human capital. But on the other hand, for education, it's quite easy to get a report card, quite literally, of the past track record and the decision to say this is a good candidate to invest in. And so I think it will penetrate education loan markets. It will penetrate sort of, you know, what you're talking about, which is, you know, someone who is brewing coffee at home. And now you can see through Zomato, you know, month on month, exactly how they've been growing or someone's baking. And and those things, they're also part of the formal economy increasingly, thanks to, you know, GSTN, UPI, all of that put together. So it's becoming much easier for that tiny sliver, which was, you know, earlier kept outside by the gatekeepers to now have access to more credit. But I very much appreciate your point of how tiny that group is, you know, the group that will first capitalize on that benefit and to truly democratize, you know, something else has to get figured out. Like when can we buy cars with it, for instance, right? Yeah. And and so other the, things. Yeah, yeah. The metaphor, I think, always is, uh, if you look at take James Scott's wonderful book, Seeing Like a State. Seeing Like a State, yeah. India's fact is sort of the binoculars for the state. It just helps you see more and bring in more people. But yeah, so that's sort of the metaphor that I'd like to kind of use. Yeah. Yeah. And we've made everything more legible, right? So the legibility factor has increased through Aadhaar, Know Your Customer, so on. We've reduced transaction costs through UPI and peer-to-peer -peer payment systems and so on. But fundamentally, the factor markets, the public infrastructure, the public goods, the law and order, you know, all the classic things that the night watchman state has to provide, which can't easily be solved peer to peer. I think you're absolutely right that until that gives it, it becomes very difficult to do this. One question I had about the broader Indian startup story is I see sort of three things going on, especially in the growth sector. You know, one sector is trying to cater to as many of the India 1A, India 1, India 2 group. This is Amazon, Flipkart, you know, now increasingly Baiju's and, and, you know, sort of so on. So these are startups that were made in India for Indians and for large number of Indians at scale. There's a second group that I see coming in, which is Indian startups made in India, but to solve very niche Indian problems. This is not Netflix, right? This is sort of trying something like, you know, Lou Cafe, which is trying to create smart toilets across India, right? So this is deep tech combined with a UPI system combined with a infrastructure problem that, you know, smaller towns are struggling with, something like that. All your climate change deep tech, which is now taking off in a big way. And then the third part, which is quite remarkable and relatively new, is the India startups who are catering to the rest of the world, right? And this is really the SaaS-driven companies. I, I mean, at least that seems to be the first push. How do you see these three? I mean, we've spoken a lot about the first category. We haven't spoken much about two and three. How do you see the second and the third in terms of the growth story? Can India really build for the rest of the world? Can it crack the cultural codes, the way those people transact, the way they pay and, and genuinely? Or are we, you know, past a point only going to be good at building out the interface and doing the back end and things that we've been traditionally good at? And also India building for Indians, but in very niche areas. So how do you see these two playing out? Let's take the first, which is really India building for the West. SaaS is pretty big and there are a lot of venture investors who do just SaaS investments, which is really built in India for the West. 
of Building India for the globe. Just like we have the Infosysers and the TCSers and the Cognizants of the world, a set of startups emerged in the early 2000s, Zoho, Freshworks, then Kissflow and Charge B and all of these forms, all out of Chennai and pioneered a certain kind of model which used content-led inbound and kind of address through inside sales. Sitting in Chennai, they would sell into Mississippi or like, you know, San Francisco, extra. Numbers now are quite large. They do about, on an annualized basis, they do about eight, nine billion dollars of revenue, okay, every year. There is a smaller India only SaaS market, which would be like a third of this. But so all put together, there would be about 12 billion dollars. But really built in India for the globe, the fresh works of the world, which listed, that's a larger part. Within that, there are two streams. The first is sort of the value stream, which is that, hey, Freshworks is doing what another company did, but we're doing it one fourth cheaper because we have India sales teams or India engineers, etc. Sort of similar to kind of the interests of the world, but they don't stay there. Slowly, they kind of it's an entire Claytonian disruption where they slowly start out and they keep getting into bigger and bigger accounts. They've started doing that. However, off late, a number of very innovative startups have emerged. Postman is a great example. Browser Stack, Lambda Test, Hasura. These are all very, very innovative startups which could have been born anywhere. Just incidental that they were in India and they're creating global products. So this number is very small and they have a very different way. I think they use what's called product-led growth as a way to kind of drive adoption. So I would say SaaS is a very promising and it's a very evolved kind of category within venture. There are playbooks that have evolved over many years. Uh, There is a flourishing Bangalore Bay Area corridor by which I mean to say that if, for example, you start out in Bangalore, you know you have to eventually go to the Bay Area to kind of set up because some of your investors may be there. So it's a very easy playbook now to kind of migrate through that corridor, so to say. And there are a set of firms which kind of help you in all aspects. So that part is, is, is a very large kind of segment. And uh, I would say I don't have the numbers ready, but I would say anyway from a third to maybe 40% of venture investments might be SaaS, like, you know, 25 to what 40% might be SaaS. I'll have to kind of go a little more kind of deeper. I'll probably give you the exact numbers later. With the second category that you mentioned, that's an interesting one. I didn't see it like that. I would say that that is really small. I think, will it remain small? No, it'll grow. But really, people using tech to solve uniquely Indian problems, you know, which are not in the consumer space, so to say, I think while there are companies, for example, there is a company in the material space called Log9. We have a company called Pixel, which is in the agri-tech, space tech space. I would say really, I think many of them look at selling still to the West, right? And I think there's a long way of someone who's uniquely focused on selling into say, India for various reasons. I think many of them using deep tech are still looking to kind of sell into the West. And hence, they come into the first category somehow. They may not be SaaS, they may be more hardware-led, but they'll come into that. So I think this is broadly a feat. The first category is really large, which is built in India for the globe SaaS. But the second category, I think it's very tiny still. I see a lot of the second category when I, you know, look at Emergent Ventures grants. And this is, of mm-hmm. course, very, very early stage, right? I mean, Bloom is too big for us in, in a sense. And I know you guys enter at a very early stage. Yeah. And, you know, I've learned a couple of things about the Indian venture capital scene. And you can tell me if I'm being very uncharitable. So one observation is it is very focused on growth and scale and not focused on broadening the base of good ideas the way US venture capital is, you know, so that is, I think, one very big problem that gap in India is filled through family and friends and angel and, you know, that kind of money. But we just don't have enough incubator programs, enough accelerator programs. You know, why Combinator, even those things come at a later stage, like we need a program in every university that will, you know, sort of fund at the 2000 USD level, 5000 USD level to get, you know, a thousand ideas blooming. And most of them won't bloom. 
but that's fine right so i really feel like i work more in that space and an indian venture seems you know not that interested in that space so is it a lack of context is it a lack of networks you know in smaller towns and you know indian universities and understanding what's going on with that kind of innovation or is this again a case of elite imitation right anyone who is credentialed by the west you know we are going to imitate that and then scale that and we know the growth and the scale model so we just pump money into that so how do you think about why the indian venture scene is not investing in early stage ideas as much as one would like you give interesting probable reasons i think a lot of it has to do with the nature of financing and the fact that when it comes to funds like us it's going to good to see it as kind of a treadmill so to say that once we invest in a particular company in 18 to 24 months we need to kind of take care of that first level of risk and probably pass it on to the next round of investor who then takes care of the next round of risk and passes it on to that so when we look at for example and when we come in it's not in isolation we have to understand that hey 18 to 24 months from now will they be in a position to kind of have a series a investor come in there i think we found out that many of these idea stages it's hard because in india as investors we understand market risk but as a fund for example we might say that product risk is hard to figure out we probably want to see some mvp by the time it comes to us when it comes to say saas it still the feeling is that hey get three four engineers and one designer into a room give them pizza and coffee and three weeks later they'll come out with some working prototype but with hardware how can you kind of predict uh, timelines so in the west for example there is for example lux or kosla labs and i've i've read about them and they have a very clear understanding that the product can be solved like this they understand how product this can be mitigated their challenges are with market risk maybe okay so in the us for example because the venture industry is so evolved and because it's much larger even the niches are large enough to have a certain set of funds deep tech funds only do deep tech they only do space they only do biotech they only do for example like beyond meat type products so they are able to take that risk product risk and india i think fundamentally shruti comes down to those two reasons one product risk is hard to kind of figure out in india you don't know how much it will kind of take to kind of have a working prototype b we look to people who are downstream of us and we look to see will it be ready for them to kind of come in 18 24 months later and typically the answer is no we've invested in hardware we've invested in some of these and it's taken a lot more time than it should have and as a result now i think the internal understanding is that if you're doing hardware deep tech we want the product to be reasonably ready with at least one customer having seen it else i think it become very hard to time it to say 15 to 18 months they raise an extra round so i think this is i think fundamental reason but yeah i mean the venture industry in india is large but large because of growth the growth capital being large the seed one is still small so when the seed one right now is around 1.7 billion dollars becomes like 5 6 7 billion dollars you will see a lot more players who are at that end who look at an idea and say hey i want to kind of put like 50000 dollars or 100000 dollars there but at this moment i think it's a little kind of out there like you no know, it's still not mainstream enough for venture No I understand but you know the way I think about it maybe this is counterintuitive but I feel like because there is so much product risk it's all the more reason that all the big venture capital firms in India should have accelerator programs which de-risk right so you start with incubator accelerator programs which will only risk $5000 $10000 and then out of those 10 15 20 ideas you know you get one really good product which has a very you know mvp is is at a stage that can be deployed for manufacturing and so on so i completely agree with you but that surprises me even more that that investment hasn't come in and i have a reason for it and you can again tell me if i'm being uncharitable i think the reason is that the indian venture scene is full of quants you know it's full of engineering mba finance type people okay here i'm being really uncharitable because my perception of them is they wouldn't know a new innovative good idea if it bit them because they like what is tried and tested right oh i know this this feels like that other saas company this tech company feels like that other tech company with this kind of a growth story or this e-commerce can be compared to this other giant so they're more willing to take risks 
in what is the you know sort of the path that has been walked before but when it's a new crazy out there idea when there is product risk they don't understand the product they're just not willing to invest because they have not been founders like the indian venture scene is not full of second third fourth generation founders it's really just full of quants again is this me being very uncharitable to the engineer mba category or are there other reasons that i'm completely missing and i'm focusing too much on the individuals who are saying no to my very very dear emerging ventures winners what you're saying is really interesting i think i would struggle to agree with you there i would struggle because i do feel that typically the folks who come into venture i'm speaking of the folks i know they're all passionate about invention they're passionate about innovation they all typically try and do one crazy investment in every fund as much as they can or there are some very deep tech funds who like to take crazy risks like you know deep tech funds for example pi meraki bloom also takes odd risks sometimes once in a while and the challenge to this is you know alluded to this earlier that you can be contrarian but then you need to be right contrarian wrong is really you invested in that mm, like you know but again if you are non contrarian is a convention led and right then you only get what everybody else gets right there's no alpha there you're doing beta you're riding the beta wave so we all really make big money when we are contrarian and right but to be contrarian and right and to be contrarian means others don't agree it has to be there's a certain time window of being contrarian and right you want to be contrarian for about a year and then suddenly everyone has to wake up and say hey that's like you know interesting and how come i didn't do that and now i need to do that investment so i think there are very few kind of opportunities like that and what happens is whenever you look at an investment because you know that you are only investing for about 18 24 months and then somebody else needs to come in you continuously looking at what your peers are looking at and how do they view this so the truth is in a way very outlandish ideas sometimes get weeded out because of this because you try to second guess them and say it may not work unless it really takes off and i don't know if it will really take off so there are occasions when you have to kind of drop certain ideas but we do for example pixel in space tech was one initially there were two founders out of college out of bits there were students there and we said no to them but then after a year and they went out on the market they kind of raised a little bit of money they tried to build a prototype and when they came to us we said wow they haven't given up like you know and there was interest from a couple of other funds and then we said chalo let's go in so i think the challenge is unfortunately in venture you're not the only one it's not like you do an investment and after that like you know no other person is going to invest because it's a staged risk you're continuously looking at how the person next after you is looking at it and you're trying to second guess on their behalf and that leads to some of the behaviors that you said i hope it changes i would love for it to change your idea about accelerators is very interesting i now need to think of a reason why uh, there are reasons specialization and a few other things including signal and risk and all that but let me not get into that now So you know here I have a question for you because I'm not well versed with the way the incentive structure works within a venture fund is this about poor management structures and poor HR structures where constantly people who are making these bets have to justify to the person senior to them and therefore it is easier to sort of go with the flow of what everyone else is doing and what everyone already recognizes is the right thing the other reason i say this is a lot of times i find that if someone has gotten a little bit money from a silicon valley fund or you know like emergent ventures or any of the small accelerator programs then indian venture is much more willing to invest in them because they're like okay this has been credentialed and i feel like the only time people rely so much on credentialing is when they have to explain to their bosses why they made a particular move and you know their bonuses and their salary and their upward mobility is completely reliant on that right so do you think something needs to be figured out within the venture fund like employment structure not really i do feel that venture the way incentives are designed at a senior level not at a junior level at a reasonably mid to senior level a lot of the money you make is in what's called carry which is when the fund ends and then they tote up all of the winners deduct all of the losers and you kind of look at what is the total number and then what is the fund size you deduct the two and then you keep 20% of 
the surplus with you and send the rest back to the people who gave you money, who are called the limited partners. So that 20% is sizable. Sometimes it can change lives. And all of us are working for that effectively. The money that we get as salaries is, is, is fine, but it's not excessively generous the way it is in private equity or investment banking or anything like that. So I would say incentives are well designed, but I think the challenge is, I think, perhaps a combination of not having seen enough outlier hits. Fact that if you invest very early on, product development takes a lot of time. So in 15 to 18 months, you can't take it to the next investor and get an up round, which at least validates you in the eyes of the boss. So a combination of these two are, I think, the real culprits. I think it's beginning to change. We're beginning to see, like I mentioned about the two funds, which are really deep tech funds. So as deep tech funds emerge, B, many of us are working in partnership with universities. We do have interaction programs with universities like IIT Madras, for example, we do interact with them. They have incubators. Sometimes venture funds also give money. Venture funds have scouts now. And you kind of alluded to it, but you said something very interesting. You said that not enough venture folks are previously founders. In a way, there is this mention of truth to it. It's changing. And so what you have today is a very interesting concept where there are a lot of founders who today are beginning to invest. Sometimes they're second time founders who've had one exit to have some money. Sometimes it's founders or even very senior operators who have got some ESOPs sold, etc. And they're beginning to invest and they are taking bold bets. They are actually taking bets on very outlier things. So what you are alluding to will happen. Will it happen soon? Yeah, it will happen very soon. I don't think it will take a long time to happen whereby some of these bets happen. It will never be enough because there will always be more ideas, more engineers, Indian founders coming out. But it will happen in the trend that you're seeing. And my only quibble, so to say, in a, in, a, in, a way, in a quibble in a very nice way is, I don't think it's do it internal incentive structures on the HR front as much. So that's the structural nature of the industry, which is kind of the fact. Yeah. I completely understand. And the, and the long pipeline for deep tech hardware, you know, that's the other part of it, right? We have mastered because we have a 30-year, 40-year head start. You know, thanks to the Infosys Wipros, which were the first gen, then, you know, building for, you know, banks abroad, then building, you know, SaaS products at a global platform. We have a sort of 30-year head start in that industry, in software, in tech. We have a 15-year, 10-year head start in e-commerce. We have a 5-year head start in ed tech. So, you know, we're at point zero when it comes to hardware in deep tech. So I, I think that's another part of it, which is there is some learning by doing and we will eventually get there. I think the other thing that will probably drive this space is the saturation in ed tech, in e-commerce. You know, once the growth model saturate in these areas, then again, if there's capital going around, then they have to put it somewhere. And then suddenly you will see a thousand accelerators bloom. And, you know, so I, I'm, I'm really hoping that that happens sooner than later. Last question for you. And I think you alluded to this right at the head of our conversation when you were talking about, you know, how the capital comes into the startup ecosystem in India. How is the Indus Valley scene impacted by US monetary policy versus Indian monetary policy? You know, are these very big predictors? Have we completely bypassed it because it's largely private money? What's a good way to think about this? I would say that certainly impacted by US monetary policy, but just because interest rates have gone up, we're not likely to see a reversal or anything like that. Because now the dam is truly opened. But I would say the spur for allocating more and more money to alt and alternative assets in India certainly was a zero interest rate regime. And I joke that, you know, as, as a venture investor, I think the biggest tailwind behind me was really the US Fed rates. And that I should wake up in the morning and kind of do a puja for the Fed governor because fundamentally it's their policy that's kind of leading to more and more money coming into India. But that joke was only true to a certain extent because what happens is once the money comes in, once the money finds uh, actors on the ground to deploy and once they start deploying and some returns start coming back, then people there believe that there is more money to be made. And now, just because rates are going up, they're not going to say, hey, let's just stop. Of course, it also now helps that China, for example, is persona non grata in the Indian, in the US context. So they are looking at India to a great degree. But returns, exits from India have started happening. So 
while yes the spur was certainly 13 14 15 we saw for example zero interest rate in country that really opened the floodgates but now that it's been on for the last six seven years we're unlikely to see it going back if i take for example bloom's case itself we started out as a 20 million dollar fund in 2011 we nearly did a 300 million dollar 290 million dollars is the exact amount and the kind of interest that we're seeing now with the U.S. folks reaching out to us, I think there's fundamentally a sense that things have changed. And I kind of talk about this uh, line that it's India's moment. And for various reasons, I think that's true. And all of those trifecta of factors that I alluded to are kind of coming together. And I think, yes, U.S. monetary policies will probably kind of evolve and I can't see it going up very much more. But let's see what happens. As far as India monetary policy is concerned, I don't think it plays much of a role, Shruti, to be very, very honest. The RBI is a very, very important actor, especially as FinTech goes. They control the approvals. Yes, yes. And ma- many other factors. They change policies. And there's a joke that scare an Indian FinTech founder in three words and you say new RBI policy. Like, you know, and but uh, I think Indian monetary policy has no impact because bulk of the money that's coming in is coming from the West. And while off late, a small Indian family office kind of set of contributors and like, you know, investors have emerged, it's still not comparable to what we get from the West. So that is really my answer. Yeah, hopefully that changes. And, you know, there's uh, less crowding out by the government of Indian investment. And, you know, there's more money coming in from India to develop products for Indians. And, you know, I'm particularly hopeful about that, because if India can manufacture, keeping in mind developing country problems, infrastructure problems, then not only is India making for itself right now, it's also making for sub-Saharan Africa 60 years from today. Because, you know, Africa is going to add a couple of billion people in the next century, right? It's going to be the next India. So if we can crack that problem for ourselves, we'll also crack that problem in the future for the world. So, you know, the manufacturing, the infrastructure problems, I really think at least I'm very hopeful that, you know, that matures in India over the next 10, 15 years. Well put, I was in Egypt about six months back and met a bunch of Egyptian founders and they all told me this, that we actually study India, perhaps, you know, much the way we study Valley that we look at India and say, India has been here. This is, India is five years ahead of us. What happens in India will come to us five years later. So you're right. India is being seen as a champion for much of the global South. And yeah, so we do have a responsibility. You're right in that degree. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if we can make money off of fulfilling our responsibility, you know, what can be better than that? That's the loveliest thing about, you know, what's happening in the in the Indus Valley ecosystem. Sajid, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and for the report that that you guys put out every year. I can imagine how much work that takes given the lack of aggregate data in India, you know, at a granular level and hope to chat with you again soon. This was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed this. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Ideas of India is produced by the Mercatus Centre at George Mason University. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or your favourite podcast app. Help us grow by giving us a rating and leaving a review. Follow us on Twitter at S. Rajagopalan and at Ideas of India. Also check out our initiative commemorating 30 years of India's market reforms at the 1991project.com.